Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. And thank you for allowing us to do work that we find meaningful. Thank you for giving us the most valuable commodity you have, your attention. We promise to do our very best to give you a return on it. Today we have our silver guru, David Morgan of themorganreport.com. We're going to pick his brain on the silver bet and your companies. David, thank you for coming back on the show. Well, thank you, Steve. It's great to be back. Oh, the pleasure's all on this side of the table, sir. Uh, okay, let's start out kind of macro. And what is your macro um, uh, big picture view of the world economy and financial markets as it sits today? Well, the big picture is pretty easy. Um, I mean, it's very complex, of course, but I mean, as far as uh, what's happening, <clears throat> excuse me, we're seeing a contraction in the global economy. The global economy is somewhat breaking apart, meaning rather than the globalists getting more and more power, they're actually losing it because you have big conflicts between the East and West with the Ukraine war. And then you've got the situation in the Middle East with uh, Gaza and Israel and all that. You also have a, a general contraction in uh, food supply, which is a uh, precursor to, to a Great Depression. And so you're really having more and more disharmony rather than coalescence. Uh, the globe isn't coming together more and more, and we're all happy campers, we're all trading with each other and making it one happy planet. It's going the opposite direction. At the same time, the physical economy is getting worse and worse and worse. I don't like to say these things. If you ask me, that's exactly what's happening. So we're going to see more discontent. And as the production capacity lessens and there's less goods and services per capita, you're going to see more and more disharmony. So that trend is in motion. It will continue till it actually stops. Will it ignite more wars, more conflicts, higher oil prices, higher gold prices, more discontent, a decrease in the stock market, the bond market being less popular and all that? Yes, all those things will take place. Okay, so you see a um, kind of a um, de decentralization, I guess, maybe more like a contraction in the general uh, uh, economy. You see a bifurcation increasing between the East and the West. Uh, you know, example of that might be BRICS. Uh, generally, uh, less goods and services available. Uh, the, the cheap stuff that we've been able to enjoy just by clicking uh, for Amazon is probably going to get uh, harder and harder to source. Exactly. I mean, it's already coming to the fore in some areas more than others in some situations. I mean, if you just look at like the retail market in the United States, if you type into a search engine and say, how many bankruptcies or failures of businesses have there been since 2020 when the illness started? You'll be amazed at how many are either gone. Some of these businesses have been around for like 133 years or that type of thing. They're completely kaput. And others that have downsized significantly from their chain restaurants, for example, where they may be off, you know, 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent. So it's we're not growing. I mean, the only thing that's growing is the money supply. And because of that fact, it spills over into GDP the way it's calculated. But that's not the truth. The truth is that the GDP is increasing because they're printing so damn much funny money. But the actual physical economy, now that's not to stay, Steve. I'm trying to be balanced and fair and factual. There are areas that are growing. I mean, there are certain areas that are, but most the big, big pictures, you know, the overall economy on balance, on aggregate, the whole is contracting, not expanding. But again, certain areas that are expanding. And this AI thing is um, it's very interesting. Uh, it's a sword. There's two, you know, two edges to it. One good, one not so good. I've not made up my mind. I'm trying to stay open-minded and look at it. Certainly it can be useful, but then again, if it's biased and it's not totally on board with an objective truth or objective reality, then, uh, that portends an income, <clears throat> a incompatibility with the natural laws. So when you, whenever you get into that realm where you're starting to mess with people's perceptions and you distort them and then you perpetuate the lie and you tell it often enough that people actually believe that's the truth, uh, you have a lot of distortions throughout the economy 
physical and otherwise. And that's, of course, what's taken place globally for a very long time. Now AI can accelerate that, unfortunately. So there's that downside. On the upside, uh, it can actually, you know, uh, make you more productive. You know, I've actually used it a little bit. Uh, I'm not a huge fan. One or the other, I'm pretty neutral on it. But I didn't mean to get off on this topic, but that's an area of growth. Uh, there's no doubt about it. So I thought I better bring it to the fore before we move to the next topic because, you know, like me, love me, hate me, ignore me. Uh, I am a pretty deep thinker. And so, you know, I try to look ahead. I've been pretty good at forecasting the future. Not perfect, but I can usually see fairly far because I look pretty far back and, you know, nothing new under the sun, all that stuff. So that's something that a lot of people are very interested in. So I thought I'd bring it up. Yeah, it, it, it'll be deflationary as technology gets better, stuff will get cheaper. Uh, we, <laughs> we've, we've played around a little bit with ChatGPT. Uh, asking it how uh, how to fix the economy, <laughs> you get some pretty good answers. <laughs> but I do use it as well. I use it for the YouTube uh, titles. Uh, okay, Peeper wants to know. I love these questions. We seem to get uh, uh, them pretty often. For someone who is new, who is all in cash and has not invested in metal before, what would you recommend? Stocks, ETFs, physical, or a combination of both? Yeah, I've been very consistent from like day one. And my consistency is this, you want to, you know, be real, get real and buy real, which means you always start with the physical metal first. I really have said it many times and it's not always true as far as people that, you know, get into the premium service, the paid service. But I've said, I don't think anyone should buy the Morgan report until they have a position in the physical metal. First. I mean, that's your touchstone. That's your go-to. I mean, it's peer to peer and there's no transaction costs other than maybe the amount of energy it takes for me to drop two silver quarter, you know, two silver quarters in your hand, Steve. You know, even Bitcoin's got a pretty good transaction fees these days. And so, you know, the most anonymous peer-to-peer -peer, uh, way to do business is really with gold and silver coins. It was so, wait a minute, David, you don't know what you're talking about. I do. And when you are on an exchange, believe me, you can be tracked and traced. And I'm not against cryptos. I'm involved with one that's gold and silver back. I'm also involved with one that's a software situation. But nonetheless, the truth of the matter is you run an anonymous peer-to-peer -peer transaction, you can do it with real money. So I would say buy physical first, then move on. And once you move on, I, I outline how to use the Morgan Report. And it goes through, based on your age, your risk tolerance, everything else, how much physical you should have and how it should be divided between gold and silver before you move into the stocks. And when you move into the stocks, these are the ones you buy first. These are the ones you buy second. These are the ones that you bet on. You don't put a lot of money in. And on and it goes. I mean, I have a lot of experience. I'm getting older every day, like all of us, but I'm up there. And so a lot of mistakes I've made, I don't want anyone that reads my work to make those same mistakes. I, have, I blaze that trail for you. Pay attention to what I've learned. Uh, it may not be the sexiest way to go, but it's the sound, soundest way to go. And, you know, most people that follow the guidance are pretty happy. So I'll leave it there. Okay. All right. So definitely start with phys uh, physicals uh, first and then kind of move your way uh, down the um, uh, betting into the uh, stock market. Okay. That kind of ties into some of these other questions from Kevin uh, Therand, SG. They're basically asking um, in a uh, environment that I think a lot of this the people watching this channel think we may be heading into in the next decade or two. Um, do you think that there's going to be any uh, premium on uh, maybe American, uh, uh, you know, gold and silver as opposed to uh, South African or, uh, you know, Australian or, uh, you know, is there going to be, be, will the sovereign coins be more safe? Uh, is there a chance that the government could confiscate ones that aren't sovereign coins? What, what are your, what's your take on that? Yeah, that's a pretty broad topic. So I'll go back to something that's on the internet for free. It hasn't been looked at that much, you know, recently called the 10 rules of silver investing. So again, if you go to search engine, type in 10 rules of silver investing by David Morgan, it'll pop up. There's been a lot of uh, web 1.0s that have, basically cut and pasted that, which, I, you know, it's not copyright. It's for everybody, for their benefit. And in that, I talk about an ounce of silver is an ounce of silver. And that's true. You know, whether it's stamped by a government or stamped by a private mint, it's still an ounce of silver. 
So really, when things get tough, premiums drop, which means you're not going to get a lot more premium for a South African or a U.S. coin than you are from a silver round. Now, there are times where that's not true, but those are rare. But we did see them with the American Eagle, uh, you know, last year with these huge premiums. The point being, as far as confiscation goes, I doubt they'll ever confiscate silver. Is it possible to confiscate? It's possible, but I doubt it. First of all, do a thought experiment. Take up all the silver in the world and take every ounce of it. How much good does it do the government? None. <laughs> you know, the, the financial markets, about 1% of the financial markets is gold, if you put it in terms of, of fiat or dollars. And silver is like 0.02%. So if you take 0.02% of the wealth, how much good is that going to do you, Steve? Nothing. Yeah. So the chance of silver being confiscated, I just don't see it. Coming further on that point, <clears throat> there are instances in not only the U.S. coins, but others, where coin collectors will get what's called a typeset. And a typeset is that type of coin, which means a silver liberty, that's called the silver eagle, for every year it's been minted. So from 1960, uh, 1986 till present day. And to get one with the identical looking coin, but the year changes every year. It's stamped a new year. Those collections for coin collectors, you will find there are certain years that have very low mintages and you'll have to pay a premium to get that, that particular year. So I just want to make that clear. I'm not a coin collector, but I know a little bit about it. So there is that difference. So that's what we're talking about, you know, um, but overall, you want as much silver as you can get for the money. That's basically the best idea. So once you have coins, I really think you should have coins first because they're divisible. But let's say you got a you know, fairly good stack. Uh, I go from coins to bars because bars are just easier to stack and count and everything else. But if you're only going to buy 100 ounces, you want to buy 100 coins. You don't want to buy one one-ounce bar. because Now you got a, your decision to turn it into another asset you got to make one decision. You doggone better be right. Where if you've got a hundred choices, you know, you might spend 20 of them and have 80 left and, oh, didn't make a good buy on that, you know, but you still got some dry powder left. So back to you. Yeah, you can trim your position. At, uh, okay, uh, let's move on to uh, gold. I'm going to share my screen here and uh, we'll take a look at the uh, gold chart. Oh, that's the silver. Uh, this is gold. Okay, so we, this, is, this is interesting to me. I'm gonna go out to the weekly here so we can see the last 20 years or so. So we got this giant cup and handle pattern in gold. We've broken out to new all-time highs. Now this is in uh, US dollars. I'm gonna put it in euros here. In euros, it's at a all-time high. In Great British pounds, it's at an all-time high. Japanese yen, still the same thing. Chinese yuan. So essentially, everyone that has bought into this is in the black. Um, can you kind of go over what the significance of that me means? And um, uh, I heard you recently talk about, you know, this is kind of like what, what GameStop went through, that now everyone that's in is in and at a profit. And so any new money that's got to come in there, it just drives the price up. Yeah, it's uh, it's really not even game theory. It's uh, the way markets really actually work. And there's nothing more bullish than a new high. And of course, everyone's taught buy low. Um, you know, buy low, sell high. And, you know, there's probably people selling in the gold market right now, but not that many. So the idea is, yeah, uh, can you see my cursor on your chart by any chance? Uh, no. Okay. Well, anyway, going from left to right, so we're going back to like 2010. So we went from about 2000. You're showing like 1875, and then go all, go go just scoop down and back up to where it's even right again. Down here. All the perfect, perfect. Just stop there. So now what we've done is we've gone from roughly 2000 down to about 1050. I think was the low print. Mm -hmm. And then back up to 2000. So that's called a round trip. So there's somebody that bought it at 2000 back in 2011, held it all the way through all those years, and now it's broken even. When they got to break even, some of those people just gave up and sold and told their wives, I hate gold, we're out, we didn't lose a penny, I sold it for what we bought it for, but it took them on those years. That's a round trip. Never do that. You want to protect your gains with the stop. If you get in 
at the top. You want to have a stop in place so that if you're wrong, you can uh, save most of your capital and buy it back when, you know, bottoms. Anyway, the point is that now we're at a new high, which means everybody that's holding now is at a profit. And the psychology changes. Everyone that owns it now, not everyone, but 99.275% say, well, I'm holding my gold. I don't know how much higher it's going to go. So that means there's no selling pressure or very little selling pressure. So any new buying pressure, even a little bit, has to bid for the remaining gold that's available for sale, which is less and less, because the higher it goes for a while, the more people hold it. And that's exactly what happened in GameStop. In fact, they had their leader there saying, I'm holding. And as long as he was holding, everyone else, not everyone, but almost everyone was holding as well. So the float or the available amount of to the market was less, less, and less. And that's what drove the hedge funds nuts because they couldn't get any stock to buy back to exit their short positions. So same thing in any commodity. That's how markets move. So a new high is about as bullish as you can get. Now, if it starts to go exponential, and on a short-term chart it is, they will burn out uh, at some point. And so these corrections are healthy. Yeah. And what we'll see is all that green and a couple of reds in there. And thanks for doing that so quickly, Steve. What you'll see is some consolidation. And then, you know, you'll probably get back to the test point. We're looking at this chart. I would call that around 2080. So what happens in many cases, I'm not saying I'm just giving you experience of, you know, four decades or more of trading futures. And I don't trade futures much anymore once in a while. But regardless, it'll come back and kiss the breakout point, which is around 2080. So it'll come back, might do it intraday. And so it goes, you know, drops 100 bucks, basically. And then the bears say, oh, my goodness, see, these guys don't know what they're doing and it'll kiss it and come right back up. And yeah. that's pretty typical in a bull market. So the caution you know, I'll give everybody, and I've talked about this before, is when you're riding the bull, and I mean, it's analogous to a bull rider in a rodeo. The bull is going to do everything that it can to shake you off. And in a bull market, you want to ride that bull as close to the top as you possibly can. And because it's going to try to shake you off, don't let these big, uh, scary corrections shake you off. You also don't want to over leverage either. I mean, there's a lot here to talk about, but overall, great for showing the chart. We're still bullish. Um, if it comes back to the breakout, even lower, it could go lower and still be okay. Yeah, but, there's uh, a lot of support lines down here, yeah, but that's the exactly. first one is uh, that's one. Let's say it does what we're just talking about. That's extremely bullish. That's like holy moly, people don't have any idea what this third leg in the bull market's going to look like eventually. So I've said for what, more than a year and a half or so that the bull, the bull run, or excuse me, the gold run, or, so, <laughs> that's what I'm excited. The run to gold has begun. And so, yeah, what are you talking about, dude? Uh, you know, gold hasn't done anything. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hanging around 2000. All that's true. But in a gold run to gold, it starts off with the big, money and the smart money, which has been the central banks for the last two years. So I give it an analogy to a race. You know, first you walk and then you do a fast walk and then you do a jog, then you do a fast jog, then you do a run, then you do an all out sprint. Yeah. And that's the way a goal, run to gold will begin. So the run to gold is started and we've probably gone from a walk to a jog right now. So not only are the institutions paying attention, but some retail, some managed money is also paying attention. So we've got a long ways to go. Again, there'll be some scary corrections. Uh, hold your position. Don't over leverage. And uh, I'll do my best to crawl all the top like I have in the last three. Got them right. No guarantee I'll get the next one right. But I will give it to my subscribers first. And after they've had a chance to get out, uh, I'll probably put it in the public domain. Awesome. Well, I hope that day is is a ways away. <laughs> it is. It is a ways away. We just started jogging. Remember, when Good. it's an all-out sprint and you're calling and all you get is a busy signal on my phone, you know we're probably in the sprint phase. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's move on. Now, we bring up, uh, you're the silver guru. We bring up gold because, you know, this is kind of the mother and then the child is silver, which usually follows, but at a parabolic move. Uh, this green circle was the last time you were on the show. 
and you both of us basically said that looks like a pretty good time to buy to me you know where I, I i put these two lines in here one at 22 one at 26 and it just for 80 percent of this just seems to be trading in a charlie brown shirt style pattern up and down here uh oh. which we've just been running options on silj on this <laughs> up and down just to amuse ourselves until this sure. thing takes off uh, what do you see right now in the uh, in the silver market? A little bit of disappointment, really, especially with the fundamentals being so strong and the solar industry using so much. And, you know, uh, you look at the semiconductor industry, I mean, uses 44 million ounces of silver. Um, the miners are not making money, unfortunately, or several are not. So, I mean, and there's so much strength in the silver market on a fundamental basis yet the price action doesn't broadcast that uh i'm still bullish silver and i think it's still got a ways to very long ways to go i do think that um it's going to take you know further strength in the gold market to spill over to the silver market i also think that there is a large short position that somebody out there has that they're scared that um they really don't want to see silver go much higher because if they do, they're maybe in sort of a, a GameStop type of situation, maybe not to the level that GameStop was, but to a level that uh, there's not enough liquidity in the market. And if the market started to go limit up in the futures industry, for example, uh, they could be getting some pretty, pretty hairy margin calls. So, you know, and that's conjecture on my part, people. I'm just getting, you know, based on what the data that I can obtain as a fact, and then putting, uh, I would call a spin on it, but conjecture on it, that's what it looks like to me. So the, and you see a lot of the more mainstream uh, types talking about, you know, there's all this silver and all that. Well, every atom of silver still exists somewhere, but uh, for the most part, we're talking about the real world. In the real world, there's about as much investable silver above ground as there is gold. So, you know, if you talk about going, diverting to Bitcoin for a minute, but everyone talks about, well, there's only, you know, eventually 21 million Bitcoin, 21 million, you know, well, there's only three, three million thousand ounce bars of silver. So it's yeah. one seventh the amount of Bitcoin, you know, there's only three million seven, one thousand ounce bars. So well, wait a minute, you're talking about commercial bars. Exactly. It's like talking about a Bitcoin versus a Satoshi. I mean, I'm not breaking down that thousand ounce bar, which could break down to a thousand one ounce coins. What I'm saying is the big daddy, the Bitcoin itself, is, can be broken down to Satoshis if you want to say it that way. There's actually less silver. Now, there is more silver in the ground and more will come to the surface. But we're in a, if we're, we're truly in a deficit, if we're truly in a deficit, that means the above ground supply is decreasing. Whereas the above ground supply of Bitcoin is increasing. So, I mean, there's a lot to think about uh, on a real metal or a real commodity like silver. And the other thing is that silver is the most important asset or commodity, I should say, uh, in existence outside of energy. So if we look at energy, it's primarily oil. We can talk about coal. We can talk about uranium. We can talk about a lot of things. For the most part, today's world means oil. And for the high tech world, yeah, you need rhodium and you need iridium and you need platinum and you need all those things, but you really need silver. So if you're getting down to the nitty gritty, it's oil and silver that are two most important commodities to humanity. And silver is really, really undervalued versus any other commodity. You only have to put it in terms of US dollar or yen or Japan or uh, you know any currency. You need to put it in terms of what's it buying oil, wheat, corn, gold, or anything else. And you'll find if you really are a value investor, especially with gold leading the way, gold's giving you a big signal. It's kind of like flashing a, a red light at you and saying, hey, look, look at me, look at me, look at me. And no one's looking at silver because it's been so frustrating for so long that no one wants to pay attention to it. And that's when you buy. You buy when no one wants it. No one wants it right now. Yeah, I, that's been a neat litmus test since I started this show is uh, uh, what hate mail uh, uh, do I get from which commodity? And uh, lately with the drop in uranium, we've gotten some uh, hate mail on that. And then uh, I'm starting to get a lot of hate mail on silver. So I think we're pretty close. 
Uh, if that's any kind of indication, then I think we might almost be there. Uh, a question from uh, Ivan. Does David prefer uh, between the silver miners ETF and the physical silver ETF? Uh, well, maybe he means the uh, Sprott Physical uh, Silver Trust. So this would kind of be the stock market way to play uh, physical silver, right, David? And then this yep. one is more of a leverage bet of a bunch of silver miners, although wheat and precious metals is a big part of it. But uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on these two, on the PSLV and SIL? Yeah, same as before, start with your physical. And between the two, you're really comparing apples and oranges. You're comparing uh, participation by a stock uh, certificate, uh, the physical market, which really isn't truly physical, and to a play with a uh, basket of silver stocks. So those are two different investments. I prefer start with the physical and then move into the, the stock side. So that's my answer. Okay. Okay. Start with the safest bet first, and then start leveraging a little bit on uh, uh, on the other uh, uh, miners. Okay. And AK wants to know. He says, "What when silver breaks out? Which stocks are likely to follow up first? The majors or the juniors?" Majors. It's majors, mid tier, and juniors. And then it really goes to that sprint mode that. We're Run the gold where everybody's brother-in-law's cat is looking to get on the internet and buy gold or a gold stock. Uh, that's when you got to really be careful. But you also see the juniors will fly at that time. And that's a very good indicator for me to call the top. And a lot of those things will be moose pastures. So you got to be a little bit careful. Uh, you can make a lot of money in the juniors, but it's mostly timing. You really got to know what you're doing. And a lot of them at the end, not now, but when we get to that finish line or close to it or sprinting toward the finish line you need to uh lighten your position don't over leverage buy uh whatever you buy know that it's mostly just a piece of paper uh but it will accelerate and so you really have to be a good timer uh to get in and out of that market it's not for the faint of heart i own the domain silver speculator I haven't uh, enacted anything on it. And I'm not sure I'll do this, but I might, when the market gets real hot, uh, build probably with AI's help, an algorithm to put up like every silver stock that's under a dollar and track it on a daily basis and then give out like a, a tout sheet like you're at a track for betting on the horse races. Cause these are bets, these are not investments. Yeah, yeah, speculation. Um, okay, do you follow uh, core mining? Am I saying it right? I do. I've never been a big fan. Uh, it's right over by me here. I'm an hour and a half from the Silver Valley, about an hour from uh, from uh, Coeur d'Alene. I've been into their office many times. I used to know their CEO. He's long retired. Um, it's just not my favorite company. Go back when I started, when it was your age or younger. And Core was a great company with uh, Justin Rice at the helm. But uh, <clears throat> since that time, years and years and years ago, it really isn't that good a company. And there's been fits and spurts where they do okay. And then they like overspend on a mine. They, they pay way too much for it. The timing just seems to be off. I mean, I hate to badmouth any company. The good thing about CDE is it's on the New York Stock Exchange. So all the brokers that really don't pay any attention to silver and understand the fundamentals or you know, the dynamics of it and all that, they know it, they know it by symbol. And so they're likely to move into it because it's something that they could just fall back on their memory. But with the internet and everything else, there are much better positions you could take than core. You really want to um, buy something with a lot of leverage. You do buy stocks that are really beaten up like that. But remember what we showed about a round trip and a new high and all that stuff, you're much better off buying uh, at the right time. So if you're going to buy core, I would be very careful as far as when you buy it, because on a fundamental basis, there's far better companies. Okay. All right. How about uh, Fresnio? Do you follow Fresnio? I do. It's one of the biggest mines in the world. Uh, they've got uh, assets that have been mined for years and years and years, uh, but they're not doing that well either. They're really not in the profit zone like they have been in the past. Stock auto obviously reflects that. And the overall trend in silver, generally speaking, there's exception to this, but the overall big picture, as we started this conversation with, 
as the silver mines are costing more to produce an ounce and there's less ounces per cubic centimeter of uh, earth, earth. In other words, the, um, the uh, amount of silver uh, per ton is going down and down. Like the average might've been 17 ounces per ton and now it's seven ounces per ton. And yet energy costs are higher, labor costs are higher, uh, environmental costs are higher. There's more red tape and everything else. I'm just using 17 and seven as an example. I'm not saying that's Fresnia. What I'm trying to do is give the idea correctly that uh, if it costs the same amount of dirt to move and you're getting half as much silver out as, that, as you were a decade before, figure it out. You're not as profitable. Yeah, yeah. How about uh, Silvercrest? Do you follow Silver, Silvercrest? I like Silvercrest. It's on my list. I own it. I have to disclose that. Okay. All right. You like Silvercrest. We do too. <laughs> it had a nice bump recently. Did you see their last uh, uh, report? Yeah. And you were happy with it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I try to do my best. I don't get them all. You don't have to get everyone perfect to make money. And, you know, it's an amateur's game that, well, David, you didn't pick the whatever. You don't have to, you know, I mean, you have to be a mature adult. And if you're in this sector, which is one of the hardest sectors there is, and eventually it'll probably become one of the most popular sectors if, things go as they have in the past, then, uh, you know, we'll, look, we'll all look like heroes near the end, Steve, because like I said, even the moose pasture will start flying and XYZ silver mine, which is nothing more than a piece of paper with nothing behind it, goes from two cents to 12 cents to 20 bucks. <laughs> you know, I'm exaggerating, but I mean, it could get insane. I've been there. I've seen it do it. I was there when it happened the first time in my lifetime. And I fully expect if I live long enough, uh, I'll see it again. And in fact, it may be even more exciting than the last time because of the internet, the amount of participation. I mean, when I saw it when I was your age or younger, it was um, great participation, but it was really U.S. only. This time it'll be a global phenomenon. So you could see, you know, people from Europe buying U.S. stocks or people from Australia or even China. So it could be very, very interesting a few years out. Yeah, yeah, it uh yeah, it'll be, it it will be interesting because the last time this happened in the 1980s there wasn't the internet and now any Tom Dick or Jane can put up something on Instagram and it goes out to the world, you know? So when this really starts catching fire, I think it will be a generational opportunity and a lot of fun to be around for. Um okay, uh AK wants to know, what is your view on the platinum and palladium markets? Uh, I've been pretty strong on um what I've said about the other white meats, the other white metals, uh, called palladium pretty well. We got in it when it was relatively cheap and out when it was higher, but not the highest on a personal level. I actually got out of my palladium, my physical position pretty much near the top. I got out around 2,400 and I think I swapped into silver at 18. Nice catch. That was a pretty nice trade. I had a futures contract, a couple of them on a spread trade where I was short palladium and long platinum. Platinum basically went sideways, but palladium went from that 2,400 down to almost par with platinum. I exited that position about a month and a half ago. Okay. So that was a huge gain on a leverage contract. And people that don't know the futures market, stay away. Most people don't succeed. I've been successful because I made so many errors. So I've certainly made back the money I lost in the beginning. But it was a nice trade. It went for months and months. I love position trades like that. And a spread trade costs you less margin. So if you're buying an out and out long gold or short silver or long wheat or short soybean oil, whatever it is, you got to put up X margin. When you do a spread trade where you got one commodity against the other, uh, the margins are lower. So you really get some super leverage. And if you're right, and th think about it, I was really only half right. I mean, I was long platinum and short palladium. Well, platinum really didn't go up, but palladium sure as hell went down. So yeah, it's spread. kind of been sideways here, and uh, palladium just fell out of bed. Yeah, so I made made a nice score. There's some followers of the Morgan Report that followed me into that trade that have some pretty big smiles on their face. Nice. I, I've never done a trade like that, a swap. You know, done vertical call spreads and stuff with just one stock, but I've never done a, a swap like that. That's interesting. Um, okay, he also asks about, uh, well, you know what, let me hit this chart uh, real quick. This is one of my favorite. What I did with this one was I added platinum and palladium together, the dollar price, divided by two, 
so that you get the average cost per ounce of platinum and palladium and then divided that by gold. And so we can get the ratio of the two combined uh, uh, divided by gold. And we can see back here in, you know, the uh, dot com bubble, you know, it took um, uh, a lot more <laughs> to get uh, uh, one ounce of gold. And look at how cheap it is right down here. It's it's less than one half. Uh, so it you can get a half an ounce of gold uh, for one ounce of these two and look at in history it's gone up to three so we are just at it's just in the toilet down here and that gets me pretty excited as a contrarian for both of well, them I've, I have no uh, palladium position at all and I exited the spread I just talked about mm -hmm. but I've been buying platinum over the last oh, I don't know less than a year mm -hmm. but the last several months uh, I continue to add but going back to palladium um, there's something like $120 million worth of palladium available in the registered category. And there's a short position of about 10 times. That amount. Huh. So I don't, I, I've, I've thought for years, Steve, why do they even have platinum palladium on the futures exchange? Yeah. Because they're such small markets. I mean, it could take one family office in Saudi Arabia to buy up the complete palladium market. Huh. I mean, it's such a small market. Not that the authorities wouldn't come in and tell these guys they can't do it or whatever, but um, something's going on there. I mean, if you've got to have to uh, have a tent and fold position against the physical reality to keep it in this uh, price, uh, at this price, um, it smells like I talked about the silver market, you know, and my conjecture on that. So I'd apply that to uh, palladium, platinum somewhat as well. The, pro, the if you want to call it a problem is they're just really not recognized as money even if from a classical sense you could argue they are the market doesn't treat them that way and you can make that argument about silver but that's only partially true because silver for most silver bugs no it's both industrial and money and if you go into the latin languages it, it means money so it's hard to tell somebody in france or spain or Mexico or Argentina that silver's not money when it's the same freaking word. So, <laughs> but but anyway, uh, so there you go. I I, I well, the reason I'm bullish platinum is everyone you know pretty much hates it and ignores it. Yeah, there's so many problems in South Africa right now with energy, labor, yes, political stress, and seventy percent of the market comes from South Africa. So any disruption might shoot it up in a vertical manner. And if that's to happen, I'll probably off like half my position and then ride the rest uh, just to get a quick cough. I'm, I'm not forecasting that, but it's, it's fairly likely. And I also thought it was the safest bet. In other words, if I'm buying platinum for a lot less than they can mine it for, uh, usually you don't have a whole much more downside risk. Yeah, we saw that in silver when it got down to seventeen or eighteen. That uh, what what what's the all in sustaining cost average for platinum miners? Do you know? I don't. Uh, I had it in my head a while back. I think it's pretty close to where we are right now. Perfect. I know that uh, ten or or twelve percent of the market was higher, and they've closed those mines down. So a lot of uh, the let's say smaller platinum mines have been closed because they just can't make a profit. And even the ones that are still open are underwater in many cases. So uh, the lower it goes, the less profit they can make. A lot of consolidation. Uh, the Platinum Guild just put out, out their report. I read it once. Usually I read these things two or three times, so I don't have it all in my head right now, Steve. But uh, a lot of the bigger platinum producers are just cutting the employment back substantially, something like 40%, okay. uh, because they're having such hard times. Okay. I know Russia is also uh, selling a lot of platinum and palladium, which doesn't help the price in the short term, but those supplies are not in, uh, infinite. They will, they will run out at some point. Uh, but, uh, oh, he also wants to know about tin. I've never followed Tim or even tin or looked it up until this morning, but uh, do, you, do you follow tin at all? Can't help him there. No. Okay. All right. Neither can I. Uh, okay. Now, Hire the World wants to know about uh, possible like offshore storage options. Uh, so we're a bit of a prepper ourselves. 
uh, haven't done any offshore storage, but what, what, what do you know about that? Well, there are some, I mean, I'm with one, I won't name it cause I want to bias this, but, uh, there are some good ones. Um, probably best thing to do is DM me on Twitter. I'll give you some, uh, couple examples of people I know and trust and you can make up your own mind. I don't want to verbalize it, uh, just for, uh, just to be as fair as I can. Uh, I think that's a, a better way to go, but there are got to be real careful anywhere. I mean, I've just looked at one. Uh, I don't have the brochure right in front of me. I actually had it here a minute ago. And it was one I really did a lot of due diligence on. In fact, I visited their facility and everything else. And I think they were totally on the up and up for probably over a decade. But they went south and I endorsed them. I lost 2,000 ounces of silver with them. Oh, bummer. And, uh, you know, stinger. I mean, all I could, I'm human, you know, I make mistakes, but again, I think they were totally on the up and up and you don't know when they go rogue, but, um, you know, something happened. Uh, someone said, well, we'll just borrow a little silver. That's not ours and use it to pay our legal fees or whatever happens. I'm just making this up. But stuff like this does happen with the full intent of making it up, you know, on the next transaction and paying it off. And no one knows except, you know, them and their, their, you know, accountant. And then that doesn't work out the way they expected it to. And then they borrow a little, I mean, it's, it's I've seen it in this industry many times, mostly on the coin dealer side where you get a hot market and somebody walks in off the street and says, Hey, I want a monster box. And the guy doesn't have any inventory. So he takes that monster box. that has my name on it to be stored for me. And he sells it to Steve uh, full intent. He's going to the next day, get it out of a, a dealer and he's going to replace it. He's not stealing. He's just taking care of business and he's only doing it for one day and everything's good. He's an honest guy. And then something goes awry the next day and all of a sudden the market changes and he can't do it or whatever. And all of a sudden he's done something that he should have never done in the first place. And he's behind the eight ball and things get worse and worse and worse. And I've seen that again and again and again. So you got to be a little careful. That's why we teach, you know, if you can't touch it, you don't own it. Do I store uh, silver? I do. Um, but I damn careful with who I store with, uh, both onshore and offshore. Okay. Um, and Kent and Steve are curious about uh, the load uh, project. Uh, do you see it gaining uh, uh, precious metals? Maybe just give us a quick uh, 30 seconds on what it is. And, and I'm going to do an AMA tomorrow, Steve. I'm gonna ask me anything. I mean, the project, I love the concept. Taking a lot longer than I ever expected. I've gone emotionally up and down with it. Um, I've always said, you know, I've, I've always said, really, don't even get involved until it's totally up and functioning. But if you're willing to take the kind of risk I am, which, you know, doing futures, you're pretty much able to take risk. Uh, if you want to get into the low token side, which pays you like, a, I'll call it a dividend, but that's a long word, but you get a reward for the, for what happens in the uh, trading of it or the, or the um, as more and more uh, real silver and gold coins are exchanged, there's a spread. And you get part of that spread if you put money on the token side. So people see that as an opportunity to get some kind of reward on their silver or gold holdings. And I did that, but I didn't advocate it. I said, if you're willing to take the kind of risk I am, go ahead. But to be safe, wait until it's come to total fruition. Having said all that, I think it's going to succeed uh, in spite of the mistakes that have been made in the past and that um, it will be viable and it'll be more and more interesting as time goes on the gold and silver space itself but it's just a tool in your toolkit i would never tell anyone to put you know their silver holdings in the load it's just one thing to have that's readily accessible it's on your phone you can spend it easily eventually there's going to be a debit card we've heard that story over and over and it keeps getting delayed i'll admit that but i think again that it is going to come all the way through we are going to get over the finish line and once that's enacted we are really a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, anonymous in a lot of cases, not all uh, gold and silver digital coin that can be turned into physical. So there is a lot of opportunity here still, but I wouldn't load up on it. <laughs> Excuse the pun, but the AMA is tomorrow. So uh, I'm sure they'll record it. So if you can't be live, uh, just note it and come back and watch you ask me anything. 
we're planning to do a little more AMAs. Uh, I won't always be on the call, but I'll be on this first one. And uh, the technical types that are more savvy about, you know, all the software and how it works and operates and the protections and all that will be on there as well, because those are things that I'm not that familiar with. Okay. All right. And uh, wrapping up here, what is your forecast for gold and silver uh, to the end of 2024? Yeah, I said in the January issue for gold, it was pretty easy. We saw a 13% increase in 2023. So I saw that as a minimum for 2024. So if we had, I forget the exact number, Steve, but you know, I'll just use 2000. I could do it in my head. So you know, 10% is 200, 13% uh, <clears throat> is 2,600. So you'd be at 2,260. We're going to be there pretty soon as a minimum. And I saw 25 is probably an achievable, maybe not maximum, but I saw $2,500 gold. And then, of course, with silver, well, it's got to play catch up because gold silver ratio has gotten into what, 85, 86, 87. Yeah. I saw the ratio going back down to 70. So you could take your 2,500 and do a gold silver ratio of 70 and get your silver price. And I'm sorry, what for the silver price? So what 170th of 2,500 would be the maximum. I think I was looking at 30-ish or so. Okay. We really need to get above 28 for silver to do much. And it's been that trading range you showed earlier on your on your beautiful charts there. So we've got to break out of that, you know, just like gold just did. And yeah. there's nothing more, you know, bullish than a new high. Uh, 28 would not be a new high for silver, but it'd be high enough where you start getting people interested in it because not everyone owning it would be at a profit, but a lot of people would be, and there's not much upside resistance above 28. Yeah. Get to 30 or pretty much at an all time high. Yeah. Uh, for practical purposes, I'm not talking about the 48 ish that got to back in the end of uh, April, 2011. I know there's still upside resistance, but there's not a lot of it. A lot of that silver was in the futures market only, uh, some physical, of course, but a lot of that upside resistance you're showing us right now um, only existed on paper. Again, I'm not saying all of it. So you got to look yeah. at it as objectively as you can. I'm trying to be objective and not biased. Uh, but remember, both these markets are primarily paper markets, not physical markets. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we got to chew through 26. After that, the big one that you see is 28. And yeah. uh, then a, a, a bit up there at 30, but but this is the, the major uh, resistance right here is up at 28, and we sit at 25 today. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, any final thoughts? Uh, just thanks for having the interview. I love doing the questions. Um, I hope they're helpful to everyone that asks them. And uh, you can follow me on my Twitter account. It's at SilverGuru22. That's a Twitter feed. Also, I uh, just want to mention the documentary I'm doing uh, <clears throat> about the monetary problem and solutions therein. It's at silversunrise.tv. It's all one word, silversunrise.tv. You can watch a couple of trailers. So we've already put um, G. Edward Griffin, the author of uh, Creature from Junko Island, into the uh, can, as they call it, in the industry. We filmed him, got his take on uh, some very important questions about the monetary sphere. And we're going to have Foster Gamble interviewed here shortly. I'm working with David Ike presently. And we have some more very um, well-known uh, names in the industry to help us ferret through what's going on in the monetary realm and what we, the people, can do to, to right the wrong. And one last thing I'd like to say, and this is um, uh, very much a doom-gloom biased statement. But someone asked me just a couple of days ago, you know, about the whole situation, the one you started the program with. And, you know, how do we, you know, educate more people and on and on. And, you know, the greatest lesson of history is that people don't learn the lessons of history. So that's number one. Another one is an adage I picked up from the Dimes letter years ago. And I don't know who did it. I should look it up on the internet and see who actually made the quote. But once the ship has sunk, everyone knows how it might have been saved. <laughs> now that analogy is like, once the collapse happens, everyone knows they should have owned gold and silver. So it's really only after the fact that everyone will know that for a generation. Oh my goodness, if I only had some silver or had some gold or had some of both, 
I would be doing better through this collapse than I would have by owning just a cryptocurrency, for example. Then that's my conjecture. That's what history has proven in the past. Does that mean it's guaranteed for the future? And the answer is no, I'll be honest. But it's highly likely that it will be. So, you know, the main thing that maybe I've made an error in, Steve, is that I'm so passionate about what I do and my real purpose in life to right or wrong and get the monetary system back into the power of the people rather than the power of the bankers, that it's a strong message a lot of people resonates with. And so they go too far into the gold and silver space because there's the right amount for everybody. You know, I mean, if you love ice cream like me, but eat too much, you're going to get pretty big. So you just have to have the right amount where you sleep well at night. And that doesn't take that much. I mean, a kilo of silver in a financial collapse will probably do you well for quite some time. Not today, but that's what's the beauty of it. You buy a kilo now, it's pretty damn cheap. And if there is uh, very tough times going forward for a while, and we'll get through it, we always do, you're protected. But you don't have to worry about it. Because there's people that say, oh, man, it makes so much sense. I'm putting myself on the gold standard and selling everything and buying gold. Don't do that. You know, you just don't want to do it. You want to balance your portfolio, which means a little bit of metal is probably going to serve you well. You can sleep well at night. You won't be mad at me. You won't be mad at yourself. Life goes on and, you know, maybe Tesla's the best, you know, company that ever existed. I don't personally feel that way, but uh, the market knows more than me. I'll put it in those terms. Those are wise words. You know, don't over, it's easy when you first find out, because, you know, you can probably find out, uh, uh, learn about gold and silver in a 45 minute Google search and educate yourself pretty quick and get very scared in those 45 minutes and, and go way further in than you should to, uh, to start it out. But, you know, I like your dollar cost average uh, yeah. thing. That's just a way to uh, just set aside a certain percentage of your income every month and just put it into and look at it like savings. You know? Yeah, it's a good way. And if you look at the dollar cost savings, I put that in the uh, 10 rules of silver investing also. I mean, even like one that I, have uh, promoted over uh, a few times is uh, we used to be called Silver Saver. Now it's called the Own X. But you look at the chart, and even as poorly as silver's done, if you started dollar cost averaging the same amount from the start of that program till now, you're up. You're up in real terms. So you know, as long as we're in a bull market, we still are, especially in gold, starting to break out. As we've said several times, you're going to do all right. Yeah, it, I'm here to help. I'm not here to hurt any. Uh, but there's the right amount of cough syrup. <laughs> I mean, you just don't want to take too much. A lot of people do, and then they're mad and blah, 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 blah. I've already said it. But uh, I would say I've just beat myself up slightly because I think perhaps I didn't emphasize that enough. Although in the 10 Rules of Silver Investing, I say it. Rule number 10 is, you know, too much of a good thing is too much. It's like cough syrup. You take too much. It's not going to make you well. It's going to hurt you. So I said at that time, 10% is plenty. I did up that to 20% at a conference, Precious Metals Conference in San Francisco years ago due to the war conditions. Because once you get into you know, global conflict, it usually accelerates. I mean, bombs move markets. And so I thought, you know, but there's kind of three phases. There's the very conservative. I just need enough. If something really goes awry, that'd be like 10%. I'm pretty sure things are going to go awry. That's like 15%. And I'm certain something bad's going to happen. That's 20%. But no more than that. There you go. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, check out David's website in the pinned comment below. It's an affiliate link. I want to grow my finances just like you. And you sign up for David's website it doesn't cost you an extra dime and you kick back a little bit to your favorite show thank you for always being here and thank you for tuning in hit the like and subscribe and share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it it's probably your buddy that can't stop talking about tech stocks you have yourself a great rest of the day and we will talk to you next time